So, so Jeff, um, I mean, obviously the technology uh, before uh, before actually we spoke again a couple of years ago uh, was only just coming on the market. You had only, I think, enough of these to you know fulfill some of your kind of bigger government uh, right. and one broadcaster. Like a real early adopter. <laughs> yeah, the, the, yeah, the one broadcast, which turned out to be uh, put up on the map quite a bit. Uh, yeah, so this is actually a video reel of all the work we've done, uh, very broadcast-like. That's what we're most well known for. It's a tiny part of our business, of course, but it gets disproportionate media coverage. These are our older systems. We've always loved large-scale multi-touch displays. These are 100-inch diagonal. They were always based on rear projection, however, and really just couldn't get it scaled down all the way to what we wanted. And the funny thing also happened since we last saw it. The iPhone and iPad really took off, so everyone's really used to that kind of feel that you get on those smaller devices. And those devices are based on a technology called capacitor, or projected capacitor displays. Traditionally, those things were not, no one thought it was possible to actually scale it up beyond the size of your phone. Uh, but we took a look, really hard look at it and we figured out how to crack that nut. So this is the world's largest projected capacitor display. It's true infinite multi-touch, you know, hundreds of points, it doesn't matter. And it's flat, it's an LCD finally, and it also has that same great feel like those phones and slates and everything we're all used to. And that's really key because it basically capacitive one and everyone's on board with that and all the users are used to that. Huh. Um, so, so it's not actually, you're not using the uh, technology that the you originally used, which right. was the disruptive, uh, I think you mentioned. FTIR, yeah, yeah exactly. frustrated total internal reflection. It was great, it carried us a long way, uh, but we really wanted to get them down to a desktop size. We just couldn't figure out how to make that really, really thin impact. And again, the feel is just slightly different. There are about like 20 different touch technologies. They're, none of them are perfect. They all have their different niches. Capacitive, however, really is the one that consumers are really used to. So we've been able to, we want to work really hard to try to get that figured out, service an entire product line. So again, 82 inches, the world's largest multi-touch display period, the world's largest pro-cap display period. And what we're here in the Corning booth for is that we've actually now uh, 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 committed to actually now have every one of our displays be Gorilla Glass. Gorilla Glass is important because uh, when you're making something this large, you have to protect the LCD. Your phone right there actually has a covered glass on it because uh, displays are really, you're not really supposed to touch them. You get that kind of uh, fear, uh, Mira and these other weird artifacts that happen when you trail your fingers. You'll notice this device doesn't do that and that's because we put a piece of cover glass on here uh, that's two millimeters thin that's actually optically bonded to the display itself. And that means it becomes a really rugged structure like that. And we had to use the best glass in town. So this is the world's largest piece of Gorilla Glass, 82 inches bonded to a display uh, this large, and it results in a, the, most, the best experience possible. You have zero parallax, essentially. You have two millimeters of parallax, which basically means the distance between what you're touching and what the graphics are. And that's really important because other displays, especially the scale, usually space apart the sensor so far apart that when you try to hit a button, you actually miss hit often. And that's a big problem. It's actually one of the dirty secrets on a lot of uh, touch screens and why they're such a poor experience, why they're better on these smaller devices. So uh, how has the company grown since uh, since that origin? Yeah, wow. That's, uh, wow. I would say um, what, we've quadrupled in size, more than that. We're about 65 folks right now, and four offices. Uh, really awesome to be able to reinvent our entire product with the client and move on to the next thing. The other thing we're really starting to preview uh, to folks like you is that we also knew that if we were going to create a whole new technology architecture, we didn't just want to do multi-touch. Um, I didn't name this company Multi-Touch Inc. actually. So we were already thinking about what's next after this. And a lot of folks ask me that and I'll tell you what it is. It's actually Multi-Touch plus stylus. Um, and especially for the markets we're specifically focused on, which is knowledge worker, productivity, enterprise markets. You know, multi-touch is great because it means I can just go up to anything and just start manipulating it. But when you actually want to start getting real work done, let's say I just want to mark this up, it's actually a pain in the ass to use your finger. It's a blunt instrument, frankly. It just doesn't have the precision. And frankly, your, your fingers start getting tired. So what we've been able to do is actually come up with a projected capacitive technology that also simultaneously does stylus at the same time. And here's a little video of it in action, actually, of our smaller one. When you actually have, we've seen styluses before, we've seen multi-touch before, but when you actually combine them, it really becomes a one plus one equals five situation. You actually start dividing the work between your hands, where you use anyone who actually does any work, whether it's writing, whether it's sculpting, whether it's uh, painting, you want to use a tool in your dominant hand, your right hand usually, and the left hand is actually an asymmetrical, uh, uh, serves an asymmetrical function and serves to actually 
orient or hold the model or the, the, the document in place while you actually move. So you get the best of both worlds here. You get to have the immediacy of just, just moving the document around while at the same time being able to operate with precision. Um, do you still have the ability to have uh, multiple collaborative individuals working on the same screen? Yeah, yeah, we do. So we've always liked we've always liked large displays, and then we really figured out why we like that. It's because the real next the real next uh, step in computing is going to be breaking away from the personal computer. The idea that computing is not a one-to-one -one experience. Large displays are great because it's a multi-user experience, or multiple parties co-located together. Think about what happens when you can connect multiple devices together. That's also the next wave of computing. Whether it's whether it's multiple walls like this together. So I have four offices for even such a small company. You know, we collaborate all the time across this. It's a pain in the ass. We really want to solve that problem and do it right. Uh, but also, device to device interaction is actually going to be really interesting. Do you have uh, some sort of uh, you know immersive interactive? conferencing type of thing where you can have a camera attachment and simultaneously kind of work on one another's screens virtually Coming as well. Coming to my lab. I can't, I can't <laughs> talk about that here, but uh, there, there's some cool stuff we're working on. Uh, I, I'm trying to explain to you what our, what we think are the really interesting problems to solve and what we're really excited about uh, working on and what the next steps are in UI. Um, and, you know, it, it's basically great to be able to do that. Here. Well, that's awesome. Uh, so, as far as... Um, uh, kind of the, uh, the use case now. <laughs> There's an error in that equation over there. Yeah. Good, good catch. Um, as far as the use cases then, uh, do you see this actually broadening out beyond, you know, kind of enterprise and, and military uses into a, a consumer space? Yeah, right. Education, certainly, right? Well, so that's, that's an interesting one. It, it's, I wouldn't classify education as consumer. What I think, what, what's interesting in our company right now is we're now actually breaking out of these narrow vertical niche markets, right? So with devices like this, uh, our earlier devices were relatively big, multi, they let you work and develop and play with the technology and develop the applications, which were really key. However, they were not easily deployable. With this new line of products, there's really a much lower barrier of entry for adoption and the prices are coming down as well. So we really see this now, we really don't see a reason why this shouldn't be in any conference room, hmm. any workspace, any, any real room. There's a, there's a great vision that Corning and our company have in common, this vision of the future where there are just displays everywhere, information displays everywhere, you know. Uh, that is something we, we, we really share. And um, this device is a big step towards it and, and ubiquity in, in, in horizontal use cases. Just how do we just simply work together on not just an advanced 3D model, but even just a normal document or a web page, you know, really really basic kinds of collaboration that existing tools are still terrible at that impact every business, whether it's a small startup of 10 people all the way up to the biggest uh, billion dollar companies. Um, now, you know, you see out here, and this is, I'll let you get onto other stuff, sorry about that, no but uh, uh, you see out here that uh, all the, uh, the manufacturers of displays are talking about essentially smart connected displays, they're, you know, they're, you can talk about the display as a platform or even as a hub. Right. Um, and, this would seem to actually add a layer uh, to a display that hasn't existed before. I, and you know, I, I think actually, uh, it was before the iPad, certainly when we talked, and even before I think the iPhone, really. Yeah. Uh, but I have a three-year-old now, right? And the first thing he did when he saw a TV of the size was try to swipe it. He tried to actually, so do you feel like that's going to happen? Like the sort of moving of this into the consumer electronics space? Oh, absolutely. Um, <laughs> I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that our company's focused on that right now, but, we like to work at our at the, at the high end work and work the way down. Where a lot of technology trickles down. Well, I truly believe these uh, are going to hit the consumer uh, eventually. And, and I'm, saying, I'm trying to figure out the right word because I don't think it's that far out actually. But I don't want to commit to anything either. <laughs> One of the interesting things about CES this year is a proliferation of very large displays uh, that amazingly are being targeted to the consumer. So. Already, and we kind of piggyback on that because uh, the display industry is one of the biggest kind of components here. You know, I mean, we're, we're, we're a little kind of constrained by how cheaply these amazing companies can make a 70 or 80 inch panel. Once they do that, then the next step is okay, now that I have enough TVs, you know, I think we have 2.7 TVs per household, and you kind of run out of wall space. What else is going to be driving adoption of those kind of displays? And that's why smart TVs are interesting because people are now asking, yeah, we know it's a display and it's large and it's great, but what can you do with it, right? So smart TV is a good step about saying, well, it's not just a passive viewing experience, it's something that's interactive. Now, that's really going to be the driver of displays as the display industry really needs to figure out how to, how to get more of these displays into the market and adopt it. It's not just going to be, it's not going to be for passive TV. It'll be 
be for either interactivity, like what you see with the smart TVs, uh, data consumption, or the kind of things we're focused on, actual collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I think like a lot of technologies, it's, it's funny, the show's called CES, uh, it's obviously quite blurred and what kind of products are being introduced here. A lot of things are quite not consuming at all because frankly, you know, do you consider your personal phone to be a consumer device or really something I'm, you know, working eight hours a day on also? It's a, it's a pretty blurry line. I would say it's, you know, it's a ubiquity of, of, of interactivity and computing in general rather than a consumer electronics uh, uh, kind of idea. Well, so uh, the last thing then, for real this time, uh, you, you mentioned ubiquity. Uh, the, the term I think that um, I've, I've heard thrown around frequently is ambient intelligence. Uh -huh. um, so what, what do you think this type of uh, uh, technology plays uh, in that uh, role in that particular I phenomenon. Think, I think one of the most exciting things happening in UI is getting away from explicit UI. You know, this multi-touch and stylus is still explicit. It's like, great, you know, it, you kind of intentionally work with it and, and you're, you're operating a display or you're operating a computer. Um, What's going to be really interesting is when devices become a little bit more ambient in, in, in that they sense other things besides just what you're the output that you intend for input, you know? It'd be great if the display knew that there was actually several people all out here watching the display, you know? That I'm gesturing to you, that the icon, you know, that everyone's looking at this window and not that window, you know? Those are actually really interesting, subtle things that are not as explicit as, okay, multi-touch, but it's going to really change how the information and how we interact with machines, because it won't necessarily be so command-based, it'll be like, oh, we really need to have interface that start just doing, that just already anticipate, already say, well, why do I have to have to select this and then copy and paste it to my email? Well, it, it should just be able to infer a lot of those things already so I can reduce the number of steps and I can actually just say, you know, apply this kind of untapped intelligence to the computer to actually really just, again, get on and let us ignore the mundane things that we still have to do, even with a keyboard or mouse or touch or whatever. You know? So that's what I believe this whole ambient, you know, ubiquitous computing really should be about. Not how, you know, not that I have a, a microcontroller in seven devices that I'm wearing. That's not the point. The point is, how do we make machines understand even more about the environment that I'm in? And those are the kind of things that we can really have not been mined at all, and there's lots of information there. That's awesome.